In this video, I want to talk about a common question on the GMAT, which is, is my score good enough? And if you're hoping for me to say, well, as an admissions consultant, I can do a lot of magic, we can just get you in with any score, I regret to inform you that that's simply not true, but this is actually kind of the wrong question, is my score good enough? The right question is, how much time and effort would it take me to raise my score, and is that worthwhile? The schools are looking at the score for a couple of reasons. So, number one, they are looking at the score as a measure of whether you can do the coursework, but, you know, the bar is relatively low on that. Once you pass 700, 710, 720, you can clearly handle the basic finance and economics coursework. The schools are instead considering what's the impact of your GMAT score on the school's ranking, and to some degree, they may also look at the score in terms of your recruiting opportunities. The schools know very well that firms like McKinsey, Bain, or BCG use the GMAT as one of the indicators for who they want to interview. And in those regards, managing the rankings and your employability, higher is better with no limit. There's no official data here. The schools do not publish a kind of report like the class profile for the declined candidates, but there is some crowdsourced data. So I've spent some time looking at a site called MBA Data Guru that sources data from forums like the GMAT Club. People will post their scores and then also their admissions outcomes, and they've run some analysis on that. And as you'd expect, it shows that as your score goes up, so do your chances of admission. What this means, you look at your test score and you think, well, I could spend my time increasing the test score. I could spend my time on networking with the schools, on career advancement, on extracurriculars, on you know, thinking about writing my applications. You have to think about which one of those is going to give you the most bang for your buck because you've got a limited amount of time to spend on all these different things. There are a few clear indicators that you should retake the GMAT. So, number one indicator is if you've taken an official practice exam and you had a better score than what you got on your live exam, you should probably retake. So, the official practice exams are quite reliable in assessing your progress because they're based on retired questions from old live exams. Number two, if you haven't spent much time on studying yet and you still got a great score, that's a sign that if you put some work into it, you could get an even better score. That's another clear sign you should retake. And then number three, sometimes there's a little clue in something else on your profile. So if you did a great SAT performance, but only a mediocre GMAT, or if you've just graduated at summa cum laude in mathematics, you may have a little more in you than that kind of middling GMAT score. So if you fall into one of these categories, you really should do a retake. I will say that I had decided to go ahead and do my MBA and kind of went full head on. Um, the GMAT was the first and biggest hurdle for me because I was working and obviously had to study like everybody else. And I didn't do so well the first time. and you know, I got some help with that. And, and once I invested the time and energy into the GMAT, you know, it was like, I'm not going to half-ass then, sorry, I don't know if I could say that on camera. <laughs> I'm not going to, um, you know, not do it right for the application. I've gone this far now, it's taking me this long for the GMAT and I need to, you know, applications, the big step, if you will, but I need to make sure I do that right. So, you know, I haven't really exactly answered the question from the start of the video. How high does my score need to be? So, you're going to force me to give a number here. I'm going to tell you that it works like this. That you start with the class profile for the school, and you can see the kind of range and the average score for the admitted class. Then from there, you need to look at what kind of cohort of applicants you fit into. And in some cohorts, it's simply more competitive than others because of how many applicants there are. So a few of the big things that if you are a man rather than a woman, there's more men applying, they may want a little bit more. If you're an international applicant from a country where there's a very large number of well-qualified applicants, for example, China or India, the school may have the luxury to demand a score that is significantly higher than the average. 
Whereas if you come from an underrepresented group where the school is desperate to enroll more people to build the different viewpoints in the class, then you may get away with a little bit less. So that's what I'll tell you in terms of roughly what kind of score is going to put you in the ballpark. Last thing I want to say, and I know you'll understand what I mean because you've been studying all of these data sufficiency problems, is that a good score is necessary but not sufficient for your admission. That even if you get a great score, 760, 770, this does not mean on its own that despite the rest of your profile not being up to par, you're going to get into Harvard or to Wharton. That a low score can keep you out, but a high score is not an automatic ticket to admission. I realized that along with having a great GMAT score, I also needed to have uh, a compelling way to tell my story and what I'd done so far so as to be credible in the eyes of the admissions committee. And for that, I was a little lost. Um, I asked uh, around and people told me that admissions consulting is something that actually helps people sort those precisely the problems that I was facing. And uh, eventually through uh, friends of friends, I came to know about uh, Menlo. Uh, 